SpaceX is doing a lot of things at once, and we're so used to their success that it doesn't always look like much. But what they're trying to do right now with the Starship rocket is genuinely huge, and it could change the Starship program forever. Before we go deeper, make sure to subscribe to our channel for future updates about Starship and SpaceX's other groundbreaking achievements. Things are getting heated, and it's clear now that 2026 is shaping up to be one of the most important years the space industry has seen in decades. China is no longer behind the United States in human spaceflight. In some areas, they are moving faster, and that's a serious problem for U.S. leadership on the moon. Because of this pressure, the strategy is starting to change. Instead of insisting that every Starship must be fully reusable, SpaceX may build a stripped-down Starship variant designed purely for one-way deep space missions. No flaps, no heat shield, no re-entry systems, just engines, tanks, guidance, and landing hardware. The purpose is simple. Deliver large payloads to the moon as fast and reliably as possible. This shift didn't happen in a vacuum. In late 2025, after years of slow movement and internal friction at NASA, the agency got a new administrator. On December 18th, 2025, Jared Isaacman was sworn in as NASA's 15th administrator. Unlike most past leaders, Isaacman has actually flown to space with SpaceX. He understands modern commercial launch systems, rapid iteration, and why traditional timelines no longer work in a competitive environment. On the same day, President Trump signed an executive order pushing NASA to land Americans on the moon by 2028. The moon is being treated as strategic territory, and falling behind China is not an option. NASA's immediate priority is Artemis II, currently planned for April 2026. That mission will send astronauts around the moon, farther from Earth than any humans have traveled in decades. But the real challenge comes after that. Artemis III, the actual lunar landing, depends almost entirely on SpaceX. To make a 2028 landing possible, SpaceX has to complete Starship HLS and successfully land an uncrewed Starship on the moon first. What's insane about all of this is that the entire plan depends on a single company, SpaceX. This means all of the pressure and risk is concentrated on one team trying to solve several problems at the same time. The list of things that must work is very clear and very unforgiving. Starship HLS has to be completed and certified. Orbital refueling has to be demonstrated with real cryogenic propellant, not just simulations. And before any crew flies, SpaceX must land a full-scale Starship on the lunar surface without astronauts on board. There is almost no margin for repeated failures. At the moment, it's not even confirmed how many Starship HLS vehicles are being built. At an absolute minimum, SpaceX needs two. One vehicle for an uncrewed lunar landing test, and one separate vehicle for the actual Artemis III crewed mission. That alone is risky. If the test vehicle suffers a hard landing, engine damage, or a guidance failure, the entire schedule could slip by years. Starship HLS is not something you rebuild quickly. From fabrication to final integration, a single HLS can take well over a year. If NASA truly wants a 2028 landing, relying on just two highly complex vehicles is not a safe strategy. This is exactly why a simplified Starship becomes a practical solution. Instead of building multiple full-spec HLS vehicles, SpaceX could build a lighter, faster-to-produce lunar variant focused only on landing and payload delivery. This version would not be reusable and would not return to Earth. A simplified Starship would remove systems that are completely unnecessary for lunar missions. The heat shield, which normally consists of around 18,000 ceramic tiles, would be eliminated. These tiles are expensive and fragile. The aerodynamic flaps, which weigh several tons and are only used during atmospheric re-entry, would also be removed. Since the moon has no atmosphere, Starship relies entirely on its Raptor engines and reaction control thrusters to land. By removing these systems, the vehicle becomes significantly lighter. Estimates suggest the dry mass could drop by 20 to 30 percent compared to a fully reusable Starship. A standard Starship upper stage is estimated to have a dry mass of around 120 to 130 tons. 
A simplified version could potentially drop closer to 90 tons, depending on how much structure and hardware is removed. This mass reduction matters. Starship uses six Raptor engines on the upper stage, producing roughly 1,500 to 1,600 tons of thrust. With less mass to push, Super Heavy can place the vehicle into a higher energy orbit, which directly reduces how much propellant needs to be transferred in space. That could lower the number of tanker launches required for a lunar mission, which today is estimated to be anywhere from 8 to 16 refueling flights. Building a fully featured Starship currently takes around two months under ideal conditions, largely because of heat shield installation, flap integration, and structural reinforcement. A simplified Starship could realistically be assembled in about one month, at roughly half the cost. While exact numbers are not public, removing the heat shield and flap systems alone could save five to ten million dollars per vehicle. Of course, this version of Starship would be expendable. It would not fly back to Earth. But that does not mean the vehicle is wasted. After landing on the moon, it could remain on the surface and be reused in a different way. The empty tanks could serve as storage. When you compare this to NASA's current hardware, the trade-off looks reasonable. The space launch system is also expendable, and each launch is estimated to cost around $2 billion. In that context, spending $20 to $30 million on a simplified Starship to secure critical landing data. While the U.S. government is counting almost entirely on SpaceX to deliver astronauts to the moon, Blue Origin is still mostly flying short suborbital tourist missions that last about 10 minutes. That's not an exaggeration. That's literally what their active launch program looks like today. What makes this situation worse is that both companies started almost at the same time. Blue Origin was founded in 2000, SpaceX in 2002. Blue Origin even had earlier funding stability, backed directly by Jeff Bezos. Yet more than 20 years later, the difference in output is enormous. In 2023, SpaceX launched around 95 orbital missions. Most of those were Falcon 9 flights, and many used reused boosters. That single year alone exceeded what most national space agencies manage in a decade. In 2024, SpaceX went even further, crossing roughly 100 launches in one year. Launches were happening every few days. Some Falcon 9 boosters flew 15 times or more, proving rapid reuse at scale. In 2025, SpaceX has already continued that pace. Falcon 9 launches are still happening multiple times per week, while Starship test flights are ongoing at Starbase. At the same time, SpaceX is working on Starship HLS, orbital refueling, and heavy lunar cargo missions. Now compare that to Blue Origin. Blue Origin's most flown vehicle is New Shepard, which is a suborbital rocket. It does not reach orbit. It does not deploy satellites. It does not test lunar hardware. A typical New Shepard flight lasts about 10 to 11 minutes total, with only 2 to 3 minutes of weightlessness. These flights are designed for space tourism and publicity, not exploration or infrastructure. As for New Glenn, Blue Origin's long-promised orbital rocket, progress has been slow and inconsistent. After years of delays, New Glenn has only completed a very limited number of actual launch attempts, and it has not demonstrated a stable or frequent launch capability. The vehicle has faced issues related to engine readiness, integration delays, and ground system problems. There is still no regular operational cadence, no proven reusability, and no demonstrated role in lunar missions. So while SpaceX is launching dozens of orbital missions every year, recovering boosters, testing orbital refueling, and building a moon lander, Blue Origin's visible activity remains mostly tourist-focused suborbital flights. And that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.